Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar and briefing on the FDA's recently announced ban on menthol cigarettes, as well as on flavored cigar products. This is a policy that has received considerable criticism from all sides of the political spectrum, because it is one that isn't based on sound science and data, and is one that has significant negative consequences, which we will be exploring today. It's one that unites groups in opposition to it, such as the ACLU, Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network, BLM activists and victims groups, such as the families of Eric Gardner and George Floyd. But it also unites, as well as criminal justice reform people, it also, from the other side of the political spectrum, is opposed by taxpayer advocates, groups like Americans for Tax Reform, the Tax Press Protection Alliance and other groups that are here, consumer advocates, because this is a policy that isn't grounded in evidence. And this is what we'll be exploring today. What we'll be discussing at this today's briefing, firstly, is what is the data that is underpinning the FDA's decision? Is what the FDA says actually valid? Or is it based on flawed science? What does the evidence say? And then we'll be discussing what the impact will be, how the evidence from overseas demonstrates that this won't reduce smoking rates. It'll do nothing to reduce smoking rates, but rather it will create a flourishing black market. It will empower criminal syndicates and it will also lead to you know, greater smuggling, which the Department of State, US Department of State has said is a serious threat to national security because of who actually smuggles these things. And these are serious criminal syndicates, often with terrorist connections. But even more importantly is the impact it'll have on vulnerable minority populations. When you make products illegal and create a black market, it's very often the vulnerable who will be targeted by law enforcement. And we'll be discussing how the FDA's comments, we're not gonna enforce this against consumers, mean absolutely nothing because it's not the FDA who will be enforcing it, but rather police. And you will see interactions with potentially tragic consequences. We'll be discussing this on both menthol cigarettes and on flavored cigars. And we'll be concluding this by looking once again at what a better solution for the FDA is. Rather than impact introduce prohibition, that the FDA will be able to you know, what other policies can the FDA take? And we've got four great speakers who'll be joining us for this presentation. So starting off, we'll be having Guy Bentley, who's the Director of Consumer Research at the Reason Foundation, focusing on the regulation and taxation of nicotine, tobacco, alcohol, and food. He'll be followed by Yael Osofsky, who's a writer, radio host, and Deputy Director of the Consumer Choice Center. We're very, very fortunate then we'll be joined by Major Neil Franklin, who is a retired veteran of 35 years of law enforcement in the Maryland State Police and the Baltimore Police Department, following which he retired and what is the former executive director of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Finally, we'll be having Lindsay Stroud, who's the director of the Taxpayer Protection Alliance's Consumer Center, which provides data and analysis to inform and assist policymakers when addressing consumer products. After this, we'll move to a Q&A section. You should be able to write questions and answers in both the chat and through a Q&A function in the Zoom option. So if you click the Q&A function, you should be able to ask questions there. And I'm very grateful by the significant number of attendees we have here showing how important as an issue this is. And I know we have representatives here from who are political staffers on the Hill, journalists, people from think tanks, advocacy groups, and we thank everyone for joining. So without, any, without delaying any further, I will um, turn it over to Guy Bentley, who will be able to start off the discussion. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tim. And thanks everyone for joining uh, this webinar on um, the reasoning and impacts of the FDA's recently announced proposed rule as it um, applies to menthol cigarette prohibition and also flavored cigars. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks on the main claims that the Food and Drug Administration and those in favor of me menthol cigarette prohibition make as to why menthol cigarettes 
should be banned, but non-menthol cigarettes either should not be banned or are less of a priority to ban. And the FDA's case for prohibition really centers around three major claims as to why menthol is a unique public health threat requiring quite an extreme policy response in the form of prohibition. And the first of those is that menthol in of itself um, facilitates the initiation of youth smoking, more so than non-flavored or non-menthol cigarettes. Uh, the second is that menthol cigarettes are more difficult to quit than non-menthol cigarettes. Menthol cigarette smokers are alleged to have a harder time giving up menthol cigarettes even when they want to. And the third is to do with equity in that a prohibition on menthol cigarettes can significantly narrow health disparities between minority communities and um, uh, um, the white population, um, and particularly with regards to African-American smokers. So I'm gonna take those points one by one. Um, the first, the claim that menthol cigarettes are especially popular with the youth and facilitate um, initiation with smoking more so than non-menthol cigarettes is just not borne out by the data. Um, what we find, thankfully, is that youth smoking is at a historic low. 98.5% of middle and high school students don't smoke at all, which is a fantastic statistic. And of those 1.5% who do smoke cigarettes um, have either had a puff of a cigarette or used a cigarette once in the past month, more than 60% use non-menthol cigarettes. 62% use non-menthol cigarettes. So menthol cigarettes have actually been declining over the past several years in popularity with the youth that still smoke. Um, overwhelmingly, the choice of young smokers is non-menthol cigarettes. Uh, secondly, what we find is that when we analyze uh, patterns of cigarette purchases within the United States across all 50 states, we find that those states that have the highest menthol consumption actually have the lowest youth smoking rates. There is an inverse relationship between menthol smoking and um, uh, in, in the population and youth smoking, which is not something we hear very much from the FDA or from those who are supporting prohibition. We hear quite, um, quite the opposite. We also find typically that this has been known in the tobacco control literature for many years. Menthol smokers typically start later in life. The majority of smokers typically start in their teens or below the age of 18. Menthol smokers typically start when they're older, usually above the age of 18 or even in their early 20s. So quite the reverse pattern of what we would see with a product that is alleged to be especially appealing to youth. Uh, moving on to FDA's second claim that um, menthol cigarettes are especially difficult to quit, more so than non-menthol cigarettes. Um, there is conflicting research in this area, but when we look at measures, for instance, like dependency, you know, how, uh, how often uh, menthol and non-menthol -smoker, non smokers crave a cigarette, um, for instance, how long does it take them from getting up in the morning to have their first cigarette, um, we do not find major differences in dependency between menthol and non-menthol smokers, um, which is not something we should be surprised by. Nicotine content is a similar, neither cigarette is better or worse for you in any way. We don't find major differences in dependency. Um, when it comes to um, ability to quit, again, there's um, a wealth of literature on this, much of it conflicting, but when we look at the best done studies of um, menthol smokers versus non-menthol smokers in terms of quit success, those that apply proper controls and have very good sample sizes, again, what we see is no clear difference between menthol and non-menthol cigarettes in terms of ability to quit. In fact, just a week before the FDA um, uh, announced its proposed rule for menthol prohibition, Vanderbilt University came, uh, researchers came out with a very good study um, of ten, tens of thousands in the sample size that actually specifically oversampled um, African Americans who had traditionally been underrepresented in surveys of these kinds to find out whether menthol smokers and non menthol smokers quit at different rates, and also whether there was a difference between African American smokers and non Hispanic white smokers. And very clearly, what the study found is that there was no difference in, uh, uh, in either measure what you, what you looked at. Non-menthol smokers quit at the same rate as menthol smokers, 
and African-American smokers quit at the same rate as non-Hispanic white smokers. So again, um, if the FDA's claim were as strong as they purport to make it, um, we really should be seeing this very clearly show up in the data consistently, and that's not what we find. Um, we also find that menthol smokers typically smoke fewer cigarettes per day, again, which somewhat undermines FDA's point that this is a especially addictive um, uh, product whose users are especially dependent on it, as opposed to non-menthol cigarettes. Um, interestingly, one of the hypotheses that the researchers from Vanderbilt um, uh, put, a, put forward as a possible unintended consequence of menthol prohibition is that because menthol smokers smoke fewer cigarettes per day, and what we see, I'll come on to this in a little bit, uh, uh, in prohibitions around the world, when you mostly see menthol smokers use uh, turn to the illicit market or to non-menthol cigarettes, you could possibly see uh, an increase in number of cigarettes smoked. If many menthol smokers switch to non-menthol cigarettes, typically non-menthol smokers smoke more cigarettes per day. So this could be a possible unintended consequence in actually increasing net tobacco consumption amongst those who switch from menthol to non-menthol. So something FDA really needs to keep in mind as it, as it moves forward. Now, the final point FDA puts in its favor in terms of prohibition is um, uh, the idea of equity in that because there is a very large disparity in terms of who uses um, uh, menthol cigarettes, for instance, even though African-American smoking rates in the adult population are essentially the same as non-Hispanic white smoking rates, and also African-American youth sig smoke significantly less than their other peers. Um, of those African-Americans um, who use cigarettes, um, around 80 to 85% use menthol cigarettes. So the FDA claims that a significant proportion of this population will quit in response to prohibition, and that that will narrow gaps in, um, uh, in health outcomes between different groups. Um, well, one, the FDA is already behind the times on this, because actually, when we look at smoking-related diseases and cancer deaths, um, gaps have already significantly narrowed, according to the American Cancer Society. And the reason is because what I just said, um, for many years now, African-American youth have been far less likely than their peers to start smoking and start smoking at younger ages. So that has actually contributed to a significant narrowing of the gap. Um, but also considering there is no major distinction in adult smoking rates between African-Americans and white smokers and also Hispanic smokers, um, we have to question why a, a product preferred disproportionately by a segment of uh, smokers who are disproportionately African-American um, is specifically targeted for prohibition when a product that is equally as dangerous, deadly and addictive, and in fact is responsible for the majority of smoking related disease in the United States, i.e. non-menthol cigarettes, is left without prohibition and is not a target of the Biden administration. Prohibition being justified through the lens of equity should, should certainly remind people of um, previous experiences we've had with prohibitions, especially the war on drugs, which was disproportionately targeted at African-Americans, despite not using drugs um, at greater rates than other parts of the population. So it is a particularly insidious charge for the Biden administration to um, cloak a rather racially targeted prohibition in the language of equity. Um, and I won't go on to the possible unintended consequences of that because we have other experts on this call who can deal with that. But I will finish by briefly mentioning what has happened but in um, jurisdictions abroad where menthol bans have been implemented. North of the border in, Can in Canada, which has banned menthol cigarettes, what we see is incredibly lackluster performance. What we see is that the vast majority of Canadian menthol smokers continue to smoke cigarettes, and a significant proportion of those continue to buy menthol cigarettes, particularly from, uh, from um, Indigenous uh, people's reservations. So we see a distinct lack of success there. There is some research claiming that menthol smokers um, quit at a slightly higher rate uh, than non-menthol smokers um, after the prohibition. But on net, per quit attempt, you see no difference in quit rates. You see menthol smokers having slightly elevated number of quit rates, 
compared to menthol smokers, uh, compared to non-menthol smokers. But it should be noted that um, uh, it was not measured whether menthol smokers originally had started making more quit attempts than non-menthol smokers. So Canada, very disappointing from a prohibitionist perspective. But even more so in the European Union, in Poland, which has the largest menthol cigarette market in the European Union before the EU banned menthol cigarettes, around 28% of the market was menthol cigarettes, which is not exactly, but closer to the United States um, in terms of the share of the, uh, the cigarette market. Canada was less than 10% um, of its cigarette market, so very small pursuit. Um, the US, it's a, uh, more than a third of the market is uh, menthol cigarettes. But in Poland, um, a study conducted by several supporters of menthol prohibition found there was no change in cigarette sales uh, in Poland after the prohibition. People just switched to non-menthol cigarettes or found ways to adulterate their cigarettes to taste like menthol. So in the real world, we don't see great success with the promised public health gains materializing. So the science on this that FDA is putting forward is very shaky to ban one product, but not the others. And also has, I think, um, some very disturbing tinges of failed prohibitions of the past. But with that, um, I will leave it there and uh, hand off to the next speaker. Wonderful. Thank you, Guy. Uh, eloquent, as always, uh, just with the facts and figures and studies to boot. Uh, one thing that I would like to discuss here in my allotted time is uh, Guy did a very good job outlining uh, the problems and unintended consequences of a ban on uh, particularly menthol cigarettes. I'd like to look at uh, the flavored cigar market and for consumers of those products. And I think there are uh, a few studies to look at that are very interesting and a few arguments as to why this rule, uh, which is a separate FDA uh, proposed rule, is also uh, going to produce many unintended consequences. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, uh, the flavored Cigar market, uh, a bit different than normal. Obviously, most people will be purchasing their items at uh, convenience stores, gas stations, uh, sometimes cigar shops, uh, tobacconist shops, uh, specialty stores. And look at the, the sort of uh, outlying market right now. You have flavored products that have their flavor both from having the tobacco leaves steeped in a particular liquid that will have a flavor soaked in that or infused left in a room uh, with some type of aroma. Uh, so there are many different flavors that are available. There's alcohol, there's coffee, there are fruits, there are sweet flavors. And the different types of products are the normal, larger Robusto cigars, the little cigars, and then the cigarillos. And cigarillos are, I believe, of most concern in this legislation, considering they are the most popular category of cigars in the entire country. And there have been a few studies that have, have looked at sort of how people are impacted by that and for the risk benefits. Uh, so if we look at, uh, there was an FDA commission study that came out actually last year uh, that was done at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, uh, looking at premium cigars, the number of users and the health risk and found that because cigars typically are used in a way so that people are not actually inhaling the smoke, uh, they're just leaving it in their mouth, uh, and overall because they use less, uh, if we look at all the studies, uh, particularly any of the tobacco use studies, showing normal cigar users, uh, they tend to be users who are not using, you know, four or five or six cigars a day. It's a, typically a sporadic activity. And the study actually determined at the very end that premium cigars have a moderate risk to health. And that's compared to many of the different studies that we've heard about around cigarettes and daily use and much more. So I think that is something that is very interesting that is not really considered, uh, was not presented in the evidence that the FDA put forward in their proposed rule. Uh, and I think that that's something that many people forget about this is that oftentimes these products are not used in the same uh, category, let's say, as normal tobacco cigarettes, menthol cigarettes. Uh, this is not something that is used on the daily, at least that's what all the numbers tell us. Uh, it is true, however, uh, and this is something that we must admit, that uh, cigarillos that are flavored are the uh, most popular uh, product that are used by youth after e-cigarettes and vaping devices. And there have been some studies that have looked into this to try to understand. 
uh, there was a Rutgers uh, School of Public Health study that actually came out earlier this year that I think is very pressing. I'm going to read the title. They're pretty much made for blunts. Product features that facilitate marijuana use among young adult cigarillo users in the United States. So th this was a study done by, as I mentioned, academics at the Rutgers School of Public Health, uh, specifically in the Tobacco Research Department. And they had essentially found that with their study, and they reached out to uh, thousands of cigarillo users, uh, people who are self-reported users, and actually found that the uh, overwhelming majority of those who are using flavored cigarillos uh, were actually using it, uh, and mostly the papers, to roll with different cannabis products. Now, this is not something that the FDA puts into their evidence. Uh, I think for those of us who've been out in the real world, it's something that we understand and see. And it is uh, sometimes a product of choice for a lot of different people for uh, rolling bl uh, blunts and in different ways of consuming marijuana. Uh, there are ways that people have been able to do this. There are a lot of brands that have become very popular for that reason. Uh, and this is something that the FDA is not considering at all. And when we look at uh, some of the other changing attitudes that we have towards cannabis use in our country, and we know the unintended consequences of the drug war, uh, we know uh, the real cost of human lives, the real cost of hours of police investigations, putting people in prisons, broken up families. And we have a, a growing movement to change that. And that's something that at least my organization does applaud. And we think it's moving in a positive direction. But at the same time, we're having a grand stigmatization of those who use ordinary tobacco products that have their own full intended consumer choice and in that circumstance with the FDA's new proposed rule, that would be eradicated and much like uh, Guy mentioned in the earlier portion, would likely move to the black market, to the illicit market. Uh, there is demand for this product that exists, making it illegal will not make that demand go away right away. And if we look at some of the arguments against this, I think realistically, because there is this larger percentage, and if we look at the numbers, uh, particularly amongst the youth. Uh, that was the main reason that the FDA put this proposed rule together on flavored cigars. Uh, quoting from uh, the proposed rule, the proposed product standard is expected to reduce the appeal of cigars, particularly to youth and to young adults, to decrease the likelihood of experimentation, development of nicotine dependence, progression to regular use, and resulting in tobacco-related disease and death. Uh, they do discuss also uh, the uh, health equity aspect uh, that Guy was also mentioning before when it comes to the different socioeconomic groups. And I think this is uh, another circumstance where we have to see that uh, essentially this is not really solving any problems. Uh, the FDA itself in a proposed rule does price out exactly what this would cost, both in terms of lost tax revenue and also increased prices for consumers across other categories. Um, so it, <laughs> the numbers are a bit... Uh, a bit off the wall for me, uh, but essentially they can they estimate that the annualized cost will be about $112 million per year that will cost um, both consumers and for governments. And if we look at um, some of the estimated health costs uh, that either range in the lower level of perhaps $3 billion all the way up to $10.1 billion. Again, they do not have to provide larger analysis on those numbers. I'm assuming that's mostly tied to the healthcare system, uh, but yes, I think when we evaluate this, uh, consumers of flavored cigars, obviously they're not going to be uh, the number one uh, best friends with the FDA, with the regulators, uh, with the researchers who are there. Uh, but this is a product that is legal today. Uh, people are able to use it. Uh, many different communities use it for different reasons, whether it be premium cigars that people have on the golf course or whether it be people who are rolling it. Uh, with their spliffs and, and blunts in places where cannabis is legal. And that is something that we have to recognize, that people do have the ability to choose as consumers. Uh, they're able to take on that risk. There are plenty of different uh, facts and figures that we can state to justify certain aspects of it. Uh, we do know that increased enforcement and making this suddenly illegal will create all types of very bad incentives. We know that the illicit markets will spring up as a result, as they already do exist for cannabis, and they have for many, many years. Uh, we can only expect that this would grow after this rule if it is accepted and put into force. Uh, I believe it will have the same impact. It's just something to discuss and think about, you know, the 
flavored cigar market is not uh, your typical uh, pack of, of cigarettes. There are different reasons that people use these products. Uh, really, it's our consideration that they should not be held uh, to this uh, really impossible standard by the FDA. And there are always concerns about youth use, but we better job by education. We can do a better job by innovation. And that's something to where governments and a lot of uh, public health groups have actually failed and markets have delivered better, better options for all of us. And I hope we can lean on that. So look forward to any Q and A on that and uh, any of your knowledge that you might have on the flavored cigar market and choices. Thank you. So I guess I'm up. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Neil Franklin. I'm a retired major from the Maryland State Police and I've spent 34 years in Maryland policing, uh, beginning with the Maryland State Police. Um, most of my, and, and I just wanna talk a little bit briefly here about my, my background, which is I think is important because I'm definitely gonna stay within my lane here as I talk about this issue. And my lane is public safety. My lane is policing and law enforcement and illicit markets. So again, Maryland policing, Maryland State Police, where most of my career with the Maryland State Police was in either narcotics investigation, training, or criminal investigation. Again, dealing with illicit markets, not just drugs, but gun running, gun selling, uh, um, human trafficking, um, and, and those sorts of crime, organized crime, cartels, and uh, the, the markets that they um, um, deal in. So after my 34 years in policing, um, I became the executive director of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, known as LEAP. And for those of you that don't know, LEAP is basically a national law enforcement organization we're not just police, we're made up of also prosecutors, corrections officials, judges, um, federal agents, and more. So we encompass quite a bit of our criminal justice community, as we like to say, boots on the ground, those who are on the front lines of things like the war on drugs um, and, and so on. So what we do in LEAP um, and what we've been doing ever since 2002 is taking a, a critical look at policy, public policy, and how that relates to um, improving public safety, how that relates to uh, crime, and, and so on, how that relates to um, policing, prosecutor's office, our jails and our prisons, correctional facilities, and our courts. And today we're talking about a proposed piece of public policy dealing with the banning, which is literally the prohibition of menthol tobacco products. Now, one thing that we've learned, you, we can go back to the 1920s with alcohol prohibition. One thing that we've learned is that prohibiting popular, although maybe potentially um, hazardous to your health, but prohibiting popular products, products that adults love to use, it's not a good piece of public policy because when you prohibit these products, you, you basically create an illicit market. And when you create an illicit market, things happen. When you create an illicit, and I'll go a little bit later, I'll go through 10 things. Um, and it's not just 10 things, there's more, but I'm gonna go through uh, at least 10 things that occur when you have an illicit market for these products and these goods. But just like with the failed war marijuana, and we're now making dramatic changes in this country to regulate marijuana from coast to coast, beginning with the states, um, we realized just how much of a problem the prohibition of marijuana was, and we're changing those policies state by state. And as you've already heard, when you have such illicit markets, um, one thing we know for sure, the communities that I guess, bear the brunt of these failed policies that, as we say, when, when, when the country catches a cold, uh, our poor black and brown communities get pneumonia. Um, so our poor black and brown communities really catch it on the chin 
when we're, we're dealing with these uh, public policies that create illicit markets. So let me just get right to it. These are some of the things that occur once you have an illicit market for these goods and not necessarily in this order, but these are very important to me and other members of the law enforcement community. <laughs> Once, and, and, I'll, and I'll draw these 10 things directly to this issue of, of um, creating an illicit market for menthol cigarettes. And as you've heard in the black community, roughly 85% of adult smokers prefer and use menthol cigarettes, a very high number. And that's why we're going to have serious problems within the black community if we move forward with this piece of public policy. So once announced along with the timeline that there will be a, a ban, a prohibition on menthol tobacco cigarettes, you're going to see a rush. You're gonna see people beginning to buy up all available legal menthol cigarettes are going to be rushing your convenience stores, are going to be stocking up on these. Um, and why? Um, number one, if they're a user, they're going to want to have them as long as they can. And number two, there are people who probably don't even smoke, but see an opportunity to sell those cigarettes uh, within the illicit market where the prices are whatever they set them at, and they'll be able to make considerable money. Number two, Cartels and organized crime syndicates will be the first to plan for the smuggling networks that will pop up of menthol cigarettes into the country from the north, from the south, and by sea. And so these things that I am I'm telling you about now, these, this is what we've seen throughout every illicit market that we've created in this country over the past 100 years and more. Number three, workarounds will be developed. And we've already heard this mentioned, where there are methods to infuse regular cigarettes with menthol and other flavors, but mainly menthol, as we talk about this particular issue, this particular topic, whether we're talking about the filters that will be used, the chemicals that would be used, the methods for infusing, and these will also become a health issue, a health nightmare um, for those who are buying um, these illicit cigarettes being infused with, with menthol and other things. Number four, declining taxes. So the declining tax revenue will become an issue, which will lead to smuggling enforcement efforts. Now we've already seen this with the imbalance of, of taxes um, for cigarettes from one state to the next. For instance, New York City put together a, 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 an expensive um, task force, uh, I believe is headed by the Sheriff's Department in New York City to deal with the smuggling of cigarettes, untaxed cigarettes into the city of New York. Now this was done years ago, just because of a tax imbalance, a tax issue that created a smuggling network in New York City. So imagine what would happen if now we're, we're gonna be dealing with menthol cigarettes, untaxed menthol cigarettes, illicit menthol cigarettes being smuggled into New York City, being smuggled in Chicago, uh, Miami, you name it, all across this country, you're going to see law enforcement task forces pop up throughout the country. They're expensive and they're problematic. And I'll talk a little bit later about the law enforcement enforcement efforts in marginalized communities. Number five, store owner complaints will begin to pop up. Um, store owner complaints will be coming into the local uh, alderman's office, a councilman's office, a mayor's office, uh, and they'll be complaining about the illicit markets that are occurring right outside of their doors, on the street corners, begging for enforcement, for someone to come in and deal with this so that they can make the money. Well, they're no longer making the money, but someone is, so they're going to be complaining uh, because people will not be coming into their stores in the numbers that they had been in the past. And all you have to do is, is think about what happened to Mr. Eric Garner in New York a, a couple of years ago when he was selling cigarettes on a street corner and a complaint came in and he ended up dying at the hands of the, of the police. Number six, and again, I mentioned before, law enforcement task forces being created to tamp down on smuggling. smuggling. Um, 
Notice that I said tamp down because you can't stop it. We've never ever been able to stop or even come close to eliminating an illicit market for popular goods in this country or any country that I know of. Number seven, increase penalties for smuggling. So right now they're talking about, number one, the policy proposes that um, the users of these menthol cigarettes or any illicit cigarettes that may pop up, um, there will be no penalties whatsoever for the user, someone possessing. However, there will be penalties for people obviously smuggling. First of all, there are already laws on the books for in every state across this country for untaxed cigarettes, for selling untaxed cigarettes, for smuggling into the state untaxed cigarettes. So those laws already exist, but you'll see those penalties increase as the problem becomes worse. That's just how we do things here in the United States of America. Number eight, neighborhood, and this is, this is something, I'm getting into things now that are very important to me as it relates to crime, as it relates to violent crime all across this country. And this is what I'm about to talk about now is what we've seen in other illicit markets, such as the drug market. Neighborhood skirmishes for territorial control. So many people um, still fail to draw the distinct correlation between for instance, gun trafficking, violent crime, they, 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 they fail to draw that correlation between, for instance, the illicit drug market and the guns that are used in the illicit drug market to protect product, uh, money, uh, employees, and territory. They fail to draw that correlation between uh, that violence and the illicit market. So illicit markets bring with it the violence, bring with it the gun trafficking, bring with it um, Again, uh, conflict between gangs, crews, neighborhood gangs, crews, and the cartels. Number nine, is in increased interaction between police and black citizens due to smuggling and violence. See, in these poor black and brown communities, that's where you want to see the, the overt sales of such cigarettes on street corners, out in the open, just like we see with drugs today. And let me say something about these illicit markets and who most of the employees are. They are our kids. So if the goal here, if one of the goals here with banning menthol cigarettes is to protect children, you're now going to create a situation where children become the runners and the holders and ultimately the smokers, the consumers of these illicit menthol cigarettes. So you're going to have the opposite effect of what you're trying to do. So again, and not only that, now, and, and, and it creates another opportunities, opportunity for these kids to be involved in the violence that is associated, just directly connected with illicit markets. And that deeply concerns me. Um, so for, you know, and of course, number 10, for all of you trying to get your arms around human trafficking and and other types of crime that are violent crime that are important to us, the proceeds from these illicit markets, especially one like the war on drugs and especially illicit markets like uh, uh, tobacco, which are popular products, which beginning will have low penalties uh, for those who are smuggling and trafficking uh, the cigarettes, it's going to make it very attractive to those in organized crime and independent operators to get involved because the benefits are high and the downsides are very low if we're just talking about uh, monetary fines and so on. So the proceeds, which will be enormous, are, also, are used to, to prop up other things such as human trafficking and, uh, and other areas of organized crime and so on. So, you know, these are just a few reasons of many, and there are more, um, and, and I'll, I'll end with this. During a time where we're having so much conflict between police and black citizens in this country, you know, where we're looking at dramatic police reform all across this country, and many of, many of, if not most of our major cities across this country, this is not the time to put forth a piece of public policy that will potentially create more opportunities for the police to interact with any citizen in this country, especially black citizens. That's what we don't need. We're working on public policy right now, uh, police reform, to reduce the footprint of policing within our communities and to 
to bring other services into play to deal with some of the social issues and, and problems and concerns that we have in our communities. We don't need another reason for law enforcement to get involved. And um, you know, I, I could talk a little later about um, how creative we the police are in even going after the consumers of menthol cigarettes um, for other small criminal violations to apply pressure upon them, find out who's smuggling the, the cigarettes that they have within their uh, pocket or within their bag or that they're smoking. So again, um, illicit markets um, are very directly related to violent crime within our communities, um, gun trafficking, trafficking and smuggling within our communities. And that's something else that we don't need. So again, thank you for your time. And I look forward to maybe Q&A. Thank you, Major. That was very informative. Um, people who are watching, you just have to bear with me. I really do not like public speaking, even when it's virtual. So I am tasked with talking about tobacco harm reduction. Um, by the way, my name is Lindsay Stroud. I'm director of the Consumer Center at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. I'm also a board member with the American Vapors Manufacturer Association, visiting, cell, a visiting fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. And I also run the website thr101.org when I get time. So tobacco harm reduction is not exactly a new concept. It's been around for several decades. Back in 1976, Professor Michael Russell declared that people smoke for the nicotine but die from the tar. And in the, the decades after, you kind of did see a little bit of industry action, some products introduced, but I think e-cigarettes really pushed this idea of tobacco harm reduction and this narrative further. Um, and some really interesting reports and awesome reports came out about it. Um, for example, in Public Health, Eng uh, Public Health England in 2015, declared e-cigarettes be 95% safer. 2016, the Royal College of Physicians found that e-cigarettes were unlikely to exceed 5% of the harm of combustible cigarettes. Um, I always bring this up because it's interesting to note that the Royal College of Physicians was also the same public health body that the United States relied on um, for their 1964 Surgeon General report on smoking. And if you want to see a really good paper about that, I recommend going to see Carl Phillips and Marwell Glover's paper on the effects of that act. Menthol is coming down because back in 2009, Barack Obama had signed the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. And when he signed it, he quote unquote said that this law will reduce the number of American children who pick up a cigarette and become adult smokers. Now this law did a lot of things, but mostly gave the FDA authority to uh, regulate tobacco products and also banned flavors and cigarettes. And regarding menthol, there is this one line in there that nothing in the subparagraph shall be construed to limit the secretary's authority to take action applicable to menthol. And this is where we are here now. The, uh, in 20, a court did rule that the FDA could regulate e-cigarettes as tobacco products. So in 2016, the FDA did issue deeming regulations and um, products that had been introduced to the market after 2007 were to submit applications to the agency by September, 2020. Um, We've all seen what's going on with that. The FDA has issued nearly 1 million denial orders to e-liquid companies, and they cited a lack of randomized control trials to combat youth use of these products. As of late April 2020, or even today, nearly six months after they were supposed to determine authorization for these products, there's only three companies that have received marketing orders, and the companies have been issued denials, and there's about, there's about over 100,000 products that are kind of in regulatory uncertainty. Now, the big thing with the 2009 Family Smoke Gain Prevention and Tobacco Control Act is that it did create this process for establishing modified risk tobacco products. So in essence, the agency was kind of recognizing tobacco harm reduction. Now, we can argue all day about why they actually issued that. That does come at claims that a lot of these cigarette companies were marketing their products as safe or less harmful. Um, and you know, filtered cigarettes, for example. Um, but it also did create the process, the scientific process to establish that these products were safer. Um, to date, only 14 of these orders have been granted. There was a total of 40 applications. The agency actually had issued 16 refused to accept or file orders, and they've only issued actually 14 marketing orders. And this is where the agency, rather than issuing new bans, they should be issuing on this process that they have, recognizing tobacco harm reduction and giving adults this access to these products, but also just the information so they can make these decisions and informed decisions. And it's very unfortunate because, you know, in 2009, upon the signage of the TCA, the 
then, you know, President Obama remarked that, you know, one out of every five children in our country are now current smokers when they leave high school. If you go through the CDC's Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 2019, after this explosion of new products, it's actually three out of 50 that are now current smokers. So I want to keep it short and sweet because all the guys did a really good job and I don't know how much to go off on menthol and tobacco harm reduction, but that mostly that the agency should be focusing more on this because you can see the decline in smoking rates. So I, my solutions for the agency right now then issuing more bans and causing more pro problems than you already see is to kind of rework the Tobacco Control Act. I think all these tobacco products need to be issued on their continuum of risk, which Scott Gottlieb, former FDA commissioner, did recognize. Cigarettes should be treated differently than harm reduction products such as vaping, snus, smokeless tobacco, um, and all the tobacco products should be actually regulated on their level of risk. I also think that the agency should be working with manufacturers from all sectors. As you heard from Guy previously, you know, menthol cigarettes are pretty are not being used by youth. Why are we banning them to protect youth is beyond me. And ultimately, and to, you know, you know, probably finalize all of this, like I said, I'm just going to be super quick with this. The FDA should take a step back and quit causing so many problems. When you're looking at all the, you know, synthetic nicotine, I think tends to be on everyone's mind right now. If you go back to the comments in 2014, when the FDA did issue their deeming regulations, Many people did bring up the fact that because the, the way that they had written nicotine into it, that it had to be derived from a tobacco product, that they were not going to be addressing all nicotine. And at that point, it was too cost prohibitive for companies to actually use synthetic nicotine in their products. Well, after issuing all these denials, these companies did use synthetic nicotine. And then we had to get Congress involved during a pandemic to address all of that. It's time for the FDA to recognize tobacco harm reduction ultimately um, and start embracing it instead of going back, trying to fix combustible cigarettes, which are already at record lows. So, Tim, thank you. And everybody who's watching this, thank you. Hey, thank you to Lindsay and all of the other panelists. We'll shortly move into QA. I know a few people have messaged me questions, but please do type them in the QA uh, facility on. Uh, on Zoom. But just to follow on from what Lindsay said with a few um, sort of follow on remarks is that the, this is a public health issue, I think, in a way that people don't actually realise, because a lot of this goes against public health. What by closing off um, reduced risk options for people to quit smoking, and simply introducing prohibition, you're going to see a self defeating goal by the FDA, because what you're going to have is a completely unregulated marketplace through the black market. You don't, for instance, check for IDs if you go and buy cigarettes out of the back of someone's car, out of someone's car. You don't have a lot of the other enforcement mechanisms and the sort of control methods that you have. And then by cutting off reduced risk alternatives, what you're essentially just doing is rather creating a, way, a safe a way for people to quit smoking you're just creating a completely unregulated marketplace. And just one other comment that I wanted to make is that I think we spoke about one of the impacts that I don't think our speakers had time to get through, and I just wanted to note it briefly, is the financial impact of this. Because by moving to a black market, you don't only deprive the federal government of revenue, you deprive the state and local governments of much needed revenue. According to the best analysis by the Tax Foundation, which I think did a much more rigorous analysis than um, with more realistic assumptions than the FDA may have done is, it will cost up to you know, $6.6 .6 billion across all levels of government. Now, this is a huge hit in revenue, which will either lead to increased taxes or cuts in services. But it will also cause decreased revenue going thinking beyond this, because there are a lot of small businesses, bodegas, convenience stores, etc., which have raised thin margins at the moment. Um, and they may be forced to go out of business. So people will lose their jobs. And this was a personal tragedy. It's a tragedy for communities who rely on a lot of these shops, but also it's a tragedy for them. Um, yeah, for the communities, but it's also a problem for state, local government revenue. And um, I'll, we'll, I, so I think that um, what we'll do is we'll open it up to Q&A now. So if I can ask all panelists, please turn your videos on.
and will lead to the first question which we have is to Major Franklin, which is we're seeing, as you, as you mentioned, this move for policing reform at the moment, and you're seeing positive steps to decriminalise cannabis, to try and, you know, criminal justice reform is a, is a really big issue. What's the rationale for bringing back a failed policy of prohibition here that, like, what's the argument that prohibition will work now that it doesn't elsewhere and and like why are we seeing suddenly this push in your mind because I think the comment I mentioned that in order for us to add it, effectively combat it we need to try and understand their reasoning yeah so I think we can understand their reasoning I don't know how rational it is I think it's an emotional decision here obviously it's not based upon history it's not based upon uh, data and facts. I mean, the other speakers here have, have given us numbers that are, are just support, uh, you know, the reason for not moving forward with this policy to ban, uh, to prohibit. Um, so I, I think it's emotional. I, I, I think it's from a group of people who have an ax to grind with the, the tobacco companies. Um, and I, I think there, it's been, there's an effort. I think, personally, I think this is the the attempt at the beginning for a smoke-free America. Remember that term, drug-free America, that, that is absolutely impossible to achieve, which I think we've learned. Um, so harm reduction is, is the way forward. Um, Lindsay was talking about harm reduction, you know, smoking cessation programs, we're having great success in that. I think, so I think that's the reason. It's, it's, it's strictly emotional. And what we want them to do is to just take a pause, take a step back, and let's do an appropriate study, bringing all of the stakeholders to the table. Law enforcement was completely left out of this decision-making process. You know, they weren't considering the problems that would come on the heels of prohibiting menthol cigarettes, just menthol cigarettes, you know, and in, 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 again, in the Black, Brown, poor communities. And if their ultimate goal is to move forward with all tobacco products, that would be a complete disaster for this country going forward. I mean, creating a, an extremely profitable illicit market in tobacco. Again, more power and energy going to the cartels and organized crime. And again, any independent operator who feels the need, and, and again, we have so many people who are still locked out of the employment market in our poor black and brown communities. This is an opportunity for them to make a quick buck and to, and to involve themselves in a violent, illicit market of trafficking and selling tobacco products. Okay. And as a follow-up, in fact, that's to another question we received, um, which has closed very well from your comment about law enforcement being absent from this discussion. And what are the feelings in the law enforcement community about the extra costs that this would impose on them? Because uh, one would assume that increased trafficking could lead to increased crime, increased enforcement. You'll need to have, it will be a radically different form of cigarette smuggling because you'll have cartels moving products from overseas rather than just across state lines. So the, um, this will lead to probably cuts in other funding for law enforcement, diversion of resources from working with communities to enforcing them. Like what's the feeling in law enforcement and to what extent do you think this, the, the costs on law enforcement are significant? Yeah, we, 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 I, we in the organization and myself have not spoken to one police officer, one person in law enforcement who agrees with this policy going forward to ban these products because we recognize, immediately recognize uh, what's on the horizon, the increased crime. We're trying to get a handle on this uptick in violent crime now. This is not gonna help that issue. When it's gonna make it worse, considerably worse. And again, uh, as you mentioned, Tim, um, as we're trying to do better with how we interact with our citizens, you know, we're, we want to reduce the policing footprint within our communities to where we just focus on violent crime, you know, to where we just focus on, you know, uh, people who are targeting our children, you know, pedophiles, you know, serious assaults, robberies, murders, you know, carjackings. That's what we want to focus on when people are hurting other people. We don't want to be brought into another effort to deal with a public health matter, you know, something that belongs strictly in the hands of healthcare practitioners. We don't want that. 
let us focus upon the things that are most important to people as it relates to violent crime within our communities and let us have the opportunity to better our relationships between ourselves and our, uh, the communities that we that we serve. Thank you. Our next question is to Yael. <clears throat> while, you, while you mentioned that there was you know, at least some youth use of cigarillos um, for blunts and those sorts of things, there are more premium cigar products that the use by youth is completely absent. The question is, did the FDA provide any justification for banning those products, given the fact that there is no youth use whatsoever, which was their stated goal? Uh, so <clears throat> not a proposed rule. And uh, again, the study that I mentioned before was actually an FDA commissioned study that did find that the premium cigars specifically had moderate risk uh, because of the different situations, as I mentioned, you know, people not inhaling, uh, that most of the time these people are sporadic users, you know, they'll have it with their glass of bourbon. Uh, again, they won't be chopping down, uh, you know, you go Chavez style, uh, 27 cigars a day. Uh, but again, it's not something that's in there. Most of the evidence that's used when it comes to the proposed rule, if we read it uh, right there on that big old fat federal register, uh, really relies upon the youth numbers. No distinctions at all. No discussion about uh, mixing with cannabis as well. I think that's something that, again, for those of us who uh, are millennials or perhaps a bit younger, I mean, we know this, we've seen it. Uh, I, I don't understand how that does not get into the uh, fact-finding mission of the Food and Drug Administration, but uh, I believe as uh, Major Franklin uh, kind of put out there, there's more of an ideological point here uh, that has to be made. And also, uh, you know, we do cite a lot of studies where there is a lot of scientific rigor, uh, but when it comes to these, uh, you know, population surveys that are done, particularly when it comes to tobacco use, e-cigarette use, there's a lot of problems with these. There's a lot of very intelligent people who post in many of them um, I think conflating a lot of these numbers, they're, they're probably a bit higher uh, than they realistically would be. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, d we don't have uh, all the greatest of evidence from the FDA. But again, this is the proposed rule. We still have time. Uh, we're still able to gather uh, our arguments, uh, perhaps put together um, the best researchers that we can, the best uh, activist lawyers that we can, and, and hopefully overturn it as well. And that, I think, perfectly leads on to what the final question we received here was, which is, um, I'm interested in what you think is the best way of going about combating this proposed rule and ensuring it doesn't become law. So this is a question I think for all panelists as to what can citizens do, what can advocates do, organizations, like what should people be focusing on doing right now? Mm. No, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there, Tim. Um, firstly, the FDA has launched a comment pro, uh, process. So um, uh, if, if, if citizens' organizations are interested in participating, FDA does have a comment process where you can put forward evidence and arguments to put forward to the FDA. And it will also be holding, I believe it's two listening sessions um, during the comment process where um, uh, individuals and organizations can make a verbal case to the FDA as why is this is mistaken. So route one, there is first direct engagement with the agency and the comment period is 60 days. It was actually launched today. Um, the, um, it was open for comment. Uh, possible extension of 30 days, but we don't know whether that will um, happen or not. So if we give a working background of 60 days. Um, and secondly, it is to really make uh, members of Congress and also members of um, your state legislatures aware of what is happening, how significant this will be. This um, sort of reintroduction, as everyone has alluded to, of going taking two steps forward in terms of drug legalization and a massive step back in terms of a brand new form of prohibition, particularly on the law enforcement front, which will be an unfunded mandate to the states to enforce this because the FDA does not enforce uh, the rules against trafficking and so on. Um, this is going to be left up to federal law enforcement agencies and also state and local law enforcement agencies who will have to shoulder the burden of this. So it is really engaging members of the legislature in Congress, making them aware of the negative impacts of this and on and uh, legislators at the state level as well to, um, to really highlight the negative impacts this can have for um, uh, for the country and, and uh, uh, across communities. So there's several ways to engage here and bring awareness to the debate. 
of how this of how this can happen. This is not inevitable by any means. The FDA, you know, has frequently been defeated and slowed and uh, and so on in many areas. So this is not an inevitable logic. So this absolutely can be defeated um, uh, both through the comment process and through um, uh, members of Congress getting involved. I just want to follow up on what Guy said. Yeah, and all the vapors know, um, quite honestly, reach out to your lawmakers and just start, um, for lack of a better word, harassing them. Um, I always come to back to Shawshank Redemption with Andy Dufresne trying to get the library and he's mailing his state lawmakers every week. And after several years, he finally gets a check and then he's like, well, I'm gonna email them twice a week now. Um, they definitely need to know that this is you know, a big issue um, and the impacts. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that they hear you. And the way to do that is to keep you know, reaching out to them. Eventually you might get a response. Yeah, and, and I'll- now uh, just uh, Franklin, actually I'll, yeah go ahead you have the final word it's gonna yeah. to you. um just real quick um again this is one of the reasons the, the same um uh, reasons for ending marijuana prohibition you know because of the racial disparities that we were seeing with those who were being arrested and charged with related related crimes and here we are doing the opposite with uh, tobacco it just doesn't make any sense to me but also let your your representatives as you reach out to your representatives let them know that um, organizations such as the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives is behind this, National Organization of Latino Officers, uh, National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers, and, and, and again, uh, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And there's many more organizations that are out there of law enforcement folks who are seriously against this for the reasons that have been stated uh, in this webinar. Thanks. Um. We did receive, there are two more questions that we've received. Uh, I think we should be, we're running a little bit short on time, but I would like to try and address as many of these questions as possible. But one of the questions we received was Massachusetts did a menthol ban in 2019. Can, does it, can anyone, is anyone familiar with the effects of that ban? Yeah, I mean, we actually had uh, my colleague Jacob Rich conducted a study on this, looking at the, um, cigarette market the year before and the year after um, that has recently been released as a preprint. And what we find is that there was a huge surge in cross-border um, trade in cigarettes. So much so that in fact for um, Massachusetts and the states bordering it, compared to the year before the ban was implemented, there was a net increase in cigarette sales of 1.25%, a net increase in cigarette sales. We also have a story by Jacob Greer at Reason.com, uh, who wrote for us about arrests that have been made because of smuggling into Massachusetts. And also, I believe it's the Massachusetts Task Force on the illicit tobacco trade has mentioned increases in the illicit tobacco trade and associated crime. So refer you to all those resources. They're available at Reason.com. Um, and also, I see um, uh, Michelle Minton has put in the chat the study that I was referring to by my colleague. So yeah, but I think also Lindsay was going to jump in there as well. Oh, I was just going to say there's enough of us on here to probably talk about that. Um, but yeah, they, they did have to. I know what I was reading, the big thing was that the tobacco task force actually increased their budget by like 70 percent um, to, you know, after the ban. And yet like cigarette tax revenue is down, I think, 40 percent or something. I, I, I don't quote me on those numbers. It's in some op-ed, but that was the kind of the big irony of it is. Um, less money coming out, you know, going into the state and more money going out to just, you know, enforce the ban. So the final question, I think, is um, while you make the case that the ban on menthol will lead to increased smuggling and illicit trade, what research proves that crime rose following the initial flavoured cigarette ban and that people that used those flavoured cigarettes did not simply choose to use less harmful tobacco products? I think so, some of that is linked to in Jacob's piece and that we have had initial arrests for trafficking of menthol cigarettes, but also flavored um, e-cigarettes as well, which are of course not available under the Massachusetts ban. And so the associated um, crimes with the tobacco trade, I think you know we do definitely see in um, Massachusetts. And because the cross-border effect of 
um, the cigarette trade is so significant. Unfortunately, and also there was a significant rise in non-menthol cigarette sales within Massachusetts. So you had a lot of people getting menthol cigarettes out of state and also non-menthol cigarettes rising within the state. So unfortunately, because as Lindsay was talking about, the FDA has not promoted safer alternatives to combustible cigarettes like e-cigarettes and snus and so on. What we see is that tobacco consumption is just continuing but in its most lethal form, combustible tobacco consumption, but we haven't had enough people who want to quit switch over to safer alternatives. And FDA really should do a better job of informing people about the relative risks of safer products. And as everyone has said, transition to harm reduction instead of prohibition, which we see in the drug policy area and sexual health and so on. We should replicate those policies in the field of tobacco as well. And, and again, you just have to look at the numbers, especially again, of black smokers. A, at least 85% of black smokers use menthol cigarettes. I'm not talking about kids, I'm talking about adults. Adults who are just not gonna give it up. If they can find a way to get them, they're gonna get them. So you gotta look at the numbers here. That, okay, so thank you to all of our panelists for the time, your time. Thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. We are going to be recording this. Um, we have been recording this, so we will try and put this online very, very shortly. Um, please feel free to reach out to either me or um, T. Andrews at atr.org if you have any further questions. Um, please do, if you can, try and submit comments to the FDA, attend their listening sessions if you're able to do it, and hopefully they will actually listen. Otherwise, um, thank you very, very much for, for joining us.